That is such a beautiful song, and uh, we're good, li- nice to have, some of y'all don't know Lori Dreyer, it's nice to have Lori Dreyer up here. It's good to have her with us. Lori's been with us off and on, many, many, many years off and on, and, and it's nice to have you back here with us, and, and uh, just, uh, Elena, that was beautiful, that was beautiful, that was just wonderful. Um, what if the hard work ends in, in, dis- ends in despair? I mean, it seems like such a clear description sometimes of what life can feel like and when we're talking about gratitude it's easy as i mentioned last week for gratitude to feel gratuitous or to to be gratuitous and we don't realize it or recognize it and with a lot of good discussion throughout the week in some of the small groups that i work with as well as some emails about people like you know i'm not supposed to be thankful and um this doesn't work that that we are thankful that we list our blessings sometimes when it feels a little a little dark, a little overwhelming, that, that that's not a good practice. And, and of course, that's not what I was saying. It, in fact, it's, it's in, very important to find our gratitude in the moment. But there is something about gratitude that the psalm speaks to that always has fascinated me and compelled me to sort of think about this idea of gratitude from time to time. This, the idea in which we, that God prepares a feast uh, in the presence of our enemies, a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And our tendency is to think of that as a we-they kind of thing, right? Um, which is, again, part of the problem, I think, with where we are in the 21st century, thinking of God as out there and doing stuff, you know, so that God blesses me with these things but does it with me. And it becomes kind of an extended metaphor for a couple of things. It becomes kind of an extended metaphor for a super version of us. You know, just a much bigger, better, smarter, all-knowing version of us. Or it becomes a little more like a divine kind of Santa Claus that, um, that grants us things. And I think it's something far more profound that even perhaps whoever was writing it, whether it was David or someone else writing the Psalms back then, that there's something else in this Psalm that speaks to the way in which life itself, the very heart of life itself, is something we can lean into is something that is, is feast-worthy even in the most difficult moments of our lives. So that's kind of what I want to talk about. But I want to start off with sort of a typical Eeyore kind of reaction because most of you all know, uh, if you know me well, I'm not a, I'm not a, 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 a ebullient, effervescent person. There's a reason why I have a permanent furrow in my brow. Linda has always called me Eeyore, and I've always longed to be Poo. <laughs> I'm Eeyore with a Poo conscience, you know. I, I'm just not quite there. I, if Eeyore were a Zen monk, I'd be Eeyore like that. I'd be that kind of Eeyore. But, um, but you know the old joke where the woman is crying, the Jewish woman, and, and, and she's crying on the beach, and she calls out to God because her son is drowning, and she says, save my son, and her son comes, finally the water washes up, and her son's choking and coughing, but he's fine. She picks him up, and then she looks up and says, he had a hat? You know, Garrison Keillor in the Midwest, he'd always talk about, and Linda grew up, and Linda's family grew up in the Midwest, my wife's family grew up in the Midwest, and she always talked about this, how true it was. Garrison always talked about that if we ever bronzed our baby's shoes, we'd immediately paint them white so nobody would know, <laughs> right? So it's this kind of idea, if you're happy and you know it, that's enough. <laughs> you know, and I always wondered with that song, if you're happy and you know it, wouldn't you, I mean, how would you not know it if you were happy, right? Doesn't it seem like an obvious, seems like a redundant question, if you're happy and you know it. But then I, I was doing, reading up on, reading for this and thinking through this message, and it occurred to me that sometimes we presume the Eeyores have got it all wrong. We presume that the, that the serious people, the introverts, can't really experience happiness. They really don't know what it is to be happy, which is that dark side of when we count our blessings and the rest of us are there to sort of watch. There's this sense in which we see the happy people, and I'm speaking personally because I am an introverted person. We see the happy people, and we sort of feel like, why can't we have that, right? So we're sort of always in this constant state of kind of an emptiness. Rebecca Solnit, who is a, a wonderful writer and author, some of y'all have read some of her stuff. She often contributes to, to, the, to the Washington Post and to the New York Times. And She wrote this. She said, gratitude is a kind of hope 
that lives with an openness toward mystery, a curious openness, almost a, a Buddhist kind of comfort with wider mystery. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't necessarily know how we'll manage this recent experience of loss or pain, but we know we will continue onward. We know from our history that vistas open up where there was once only clusters of trees or walls or worn out towns. We know that inclines and mountains, she says, winding several seemingly never ending trails in dark tunnels eventually plateau, open up, and we have vista-like views. The problem is, is that too often for us, the stories that we tell ourselves are these stories that perpetuate our, our natural reptilian brain. They sort of reinforce where we go naturally with experiences. We go dark, we go inward, we go, uh, we go what I would like to kind of give you an, a, 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 a metaphor for, we, we, we are drawn by the gravity of negativity, right? It's just the nature of our brain to be drawn into that. And so we hear those stories more often than we hear the others. We hear the stories of Katrina. Solnit writes about how the stories of Katrina revolve so much around all the violence that was going on and the death that was happening in the stadium and, the, uh, and, and just the, the, the inability of the government to respond. There were all of these stories that fed us literally fed us some of us you some of you can remember how much you just leaned into that you you hung on every news report of what was happening next but the reality she says is that if you got in there what you would find is all of those people who were supposedly doing what we often think of as human nature the evil stuff the looting and such all of those people were helping one another all of those people were were were, were reaching out to each other in surprising ways no one anticipated how the Berlin Wall would fall, but it did eventually. No one saw that Martin Luther King's ass assassination did not end the civil rights immediately. It was not a failure. In fact, it perpetuated, it propelled it. In fact, someone wrote a, a couple of comic book series based on Martin Luther King's teachings, and they circulated all throughout Eastern Europe and throughout Northern Africa. And those, those papers, those comic books became the impetus for movements of freedom in those countries as well. Some would say that he was, it was a major influence in the, uh, in the Berlin Wall finally falling. Our problem is that sometimes we like to think things are black and white. And so gratitude, we tend to lean into gratitude as the things we can look at, the things that seem tangible. I'm so glad my, my children are healthy. I'm glad that I have a job. I'm glad that, that um, I have a home. I'm glad that the sun's shining today. Even we sort of, uh, we sort of compensate with an almost sort of backwards, backhanded kind of compliment, you know. We look out and say, oh, it's a little warm today. Oh, it could be so much hotter. You know, I mean, we sort, of, we sort of compensate, we sort of qualify our experiences. We do this all the time. Ann Wilson Schaaf, who wrote this book called The Addicted Society, some of you all remember this book back in the late 80s, early 90s, I think she wrote this. And, and, and she, was, she mostly dealt with recovery, with uh, working with people with alcoholism or addictions, to substance abuse addictions. But this book was a revelation. It suggested that the very heart of our culture is addicted. But not simply to, uh, to substances as, as such. We're addicted to this need for certainty, for this need for the graspable. And it's hard for us to live in the midst of mystery. So we see it in all the narratives that play out in our advertising. We see it in all the narratives that play out in our daily conversation. Even when we're just being friendly, we have this tendency to want to qualify it. Because we need to feel confident that things are okay. But things are okay anyway. We often find that once we move through, we get to the other side, as, as, as Rebecca Solnit was saying, we often find that the picture was so much bigger than us. We just didn't see it at the time. But it's hard to be present at that moment. I wrote in my, I wrote in my blog, and many of you read it, and I, 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 a bunch of you came up to me today and said, I read it, so I'm coming to listen to you. And I thought, well, shoot, that was going to be my sermon. I was going to use that. <laughs> But it also stunned me to know that more than six people read the blog, so, <laughs> so I was really excited about that. But, it's this, but, it, 
to me, this idea about how we face these difficult times, came, the, 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 it came to me when we were, when Linda and I were in, in Michigan, in northern Michigan, and we, we found this fellow sh that was fish fishing on the uh, Bear River in uh, Petoskey, uh, up in the northern part of Michigan, and the river comes right down over falls and right into uh, Little Traverse Bay, and, and it was that image that he described with, this, with salmon on, in October. When, of course, Petoskey's less than half the size it is during the summer in October because the tourists are not there. It's much, much cooler, but the colors are beautiful, he said. But he said, if you stand here, you can watch the fish. They're leaping up. He talked about how a lot of fishermen and fisher people will, will come out there, and they'll just toss the hooks in the water, and they're just hoping to snag them out of the air. They can just snag them in, by the fin, but it's illegal, so they have to throw them back now because that's what they were doing so much of. They're just literally pulling them out of the water as they leapt up trying to make their way. But in a, in a sense, that also seems true, doesn't it? Even that seems true to us sometimes, that just as we're making some headway, something else comes and snags us. Something else comes and kind of cuts us short. I mean, life is that way. How do we find that, that way forward in the midst of those challenges? But it's what salmon do that surprised me because they actually know somehow to bear themselves forward in the onrush of the water so that when they are hit by the water, it actually propels their body into the air so that with their fins and with life's own force towards them, they leap up in the air and sort of move forward a little bit to hit the next wave. And they just continue to do that as they make their way up this, the falls and up through the rapids so that they can spawn. And to me, that seems such a fascinating idea that we open up to those things sometimes that are painful in such a way that we, simp that we trust, that we trust this ground of our being, that we trust life enough to allow it to move us forward a little. But letting go of that has to be is difficult. Sitting with the pain is, is difficult. But sometimes that's necessary, that openness to allow it to move us forward. But trusting it is important. I, um, I was in Vermont, and, um, I, well, two things. First of all, my son experienced a little bit of this black and white, this need for certainty when he was coming back this uh, recently from Germany. He was flying Lufthansa, bringing back both of his dogs. And when he got to the airport, he'd gone through all the paperwork, right? And Lufthansa, the clerks, the people at the, uh, at the counter at Lufthansa said, hand us, you know, the paperwork. They were going to put them in, in kennels, put them on board and underneath, and then fly home with them. They said, your paperwork won't work. He said, I've done everything. I've, I've, I've been working on this for six weeks. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. He, they said, it won't work. And he, he said, why not? And he said, well, for one thing, Dallas-Fort Worth doesn't take animals off Luf Lufthansa. But they will take them at the Houston International Airport. So we have to reroute you to the Houston International Airport. So Tim didn't get to his hotel. He spent 13 hours in the, ho at the airport and, and uh, took pictures and you know, texted us all through the night last weekend that you know, he was still at the airport and hadn't left yet. And, and then when he finally got two hours uh, before leaving, he, he was to check in his dogs so that they would take them below and storm below. And again, they looked at the paperwork and they said, oh, wait. You're missing this form. And they said, but he said, I don't understand. I've been doing this, everything to the letter. And they said, no, no, no. If you're military, now if you've seen my son, you'd be laughing already. If you're military, you have to have this form. And my son said, I'm not military. And then they looked stunned. They did not have a paper for civilians carrying dogs on Lufthansa to, to the airport in Houston. They didn't have a form for that. So they went back and they worked with their supervisors and they came back out and they came. And finally, after about an hour and a half of even, they even went around the airport searching for a veterinarian so that they could redo the paperwork and make it official. They didn't know what to do unless it was military because they just don't deal with civilians taking animals back and forth. So finally, they gave them a form that was a disclaimer and said, we're just going to have to allow you to take the risk. And Tim smiled and said, I think I can do that, and signed the paper. <laughs> this idea of black and white sometimes overwhelms us and actually gets in the way, right? Life isn't black and white. It's gray sometimes. It surprises you. Sometimes it hits you upside the head. 
But if we open to it, if we open to it in a way that's vulnerable, that's willing to risk a little bit of the anxiety, sometimes we find that those surprises actually buoy us and actually move us up to a place of greater perspective that we can move forward through those moments, through those challenges. Gratitude has to do more with living in the midst of the mystery and whatever life is going to be coming at us, taking it moment by moment, then it has to do with the things that make us feel comfortable. Living a life of gratitude has more of a sense of openness and being rooted in life itself. This idea that in the midst of our challenges, our troubles, our enemies, our disagreements, there is a feast. The challenge for us is to look for that feast. All the while missing it, right? The thousands of acorns that are sitting underneath the oak tree. The challenges in the midst of our life, in the midst of the challenges, the difficulties, the ups and downs, to always be looking for that feast. To even see it in the people with whom we disagree. We've talked about approaching one another from the perspective of you are loved by God. You are already loved. I love you. Trying, trying that perspective to break all the barriers of differences and disagreement. The feast is already in our midst. But we have to look for it even in the difficult times. I had a great experience in Vermont um, some years back. I was driving through Burlington in a rent car. I don't know if you've been to Vermont. I'd only been there once. Um, as I was driving through, I came into a small suburb of Burlington. I was going about 20, 15 miles an hour, or 25 miles an hour. I didn't notice there was a speed limit sign right behind a tree as I came into the city limits. It was a very open four-lane boulevard and wide on either side. It, didn't really, it wasn't really a residential or business area. I was just coming into the outskirts. And it was nighttime, about 11 o'clock, so hardly anybody was on the road. All of a sudden, lights were flashing behind me. I got pulled over. Officer came up to me and he said, sir, did you know you were speeding? And I said, I had no idea. I'm going 25 miles an hour. He said, the speed limit is 20. I said, 20 miles an hour in, a big, in the outskirts of a big town? He says, well, sir, let me tell you, over the hill, there are several colleges. There's the University of Vermont. There's Burlington College. He says, you know, those students, what was happening is those students at night would just come racing up and down these streets. We put up these signs to slow things down. I looked at him and I said, so I'm not a student. He said, sir, we're trying to keep it, you know, the law for everyone. And I said, well, I can appreciate that. He said, I'll tell you what, sir. And since you didn't understand this new, this, 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 this sign and you didn't see it, I'm going to go ahead and give you a ticket. <laughs> and I said, can't you give me a warning? And he says, well, I want you to hear something very clearly, sir. What will happen if you do not pay this ticket? If you do not pay this ticket, sir, your Vermont driver's license is going to be revoked. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, but officer, I don't have a Vermont. He said, sir, I want you to listen to me very carefully. <laughs> he said, if you don't pay this back, you will not, your license will be revoked. And you can't drive with your Vermont license in Vermont after that. And I just kept looking at him until he finally he said, sir, and I said, I think I understand. <laughs> it was interesting to me how he decided he would get around this black and white, you know. He was going to find some gray way of dealing with this. And it was funny, you know, I did. I got, the, I got the court hearing. I got the letter, you know, six months later. I didn't pay my fine. I never dealt with it. Um, the interesting thing was that about uh, two years ago, I went in to have my registration renewed. And, this, and the United States now has a, a statewide interstate policy now <laughs> where they now share the fines and the, and the, and the, and the such with it. <laughs> and the woman behind the counter said, sir, did you know that you have an outstanding ticket in Vermont from 1997? <laughs> this was two years ago. I said, oh, my gosh. And she said, it's got quite, it's, it's, a, it's allotted quite a bit of, of uh, interest on it. And I said, can, you know, what do I do? And she says, well, you can call them and talk to them. And so I called Vermont, and I talked to them. And it was really, really surprising. I actually got somebody, and they were very nice about it. They said, if you'll just pay the original $50 ticket, then we'll just call the whole thing a wash. <laughs> so, so I did that. 
But you know, here's the thing. Life throws all of these unexpected things at us, and we sometimes find ourselves overwhelmed not knowing how to deal with them until we realize that how to deal with them is already present for us, right? We open up to it. We, 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 um, we as, as Till Eulenspiegel said, uh, some of y'all that read the blog remember that the old, German, the old German trickster fool who would climb the mountains with his friends and he would laugh and smile as he was climbing these hills on his journey and his friends would say, why are you smiling? And then as he would go down, he would start to get sullen and, and quiet and reflective. And then the mountains would come and he'd start back up again. And they'd say, why are you smiling while we're going up the mountain and you're sullen and reflective going down the mountain? And he would say, because I know, I know when I'm climbing the mountain that eventually I will have a perspective I didn't expect. But when I get past that, I have to let go of that and wait for the next one. And sometimes that can be challenging until I begin to make the climb again. That's what I think we are invited to do with Psalms 23. We are invited to look beyond ourselves, to be present in the moment, and to receive these wider vistas that we just don't see at the moment but they're there waiting for us. This morning, we're going to participate in the communion, but I want to do it a little differently, and I've asked uh, Sharm to help, and I think you found somebody, so I'm going to invite you and whoever's helping to serve with you, come on forward, and the Andrea is going to help as well. The band can come on up. Um, let's see, and, and then I'm, I'm going to ask, John, would you help as well? And just, would you mind finding some? Let's see, John, how about, I'll tell you what, Debbie, would you help with John? Y'all, y'all, I'll find somebody for you. So we'll have three stations. We'll have a station back here and one on either side. And I'm going to invite them to stand behind me here. And then I want to, I want to do something a little different here. We tend to think of this Eucharist or this, this communion moment as this sacrifice, this sacrificial element. The traditional image of Jesus as making a sacrifice for us. But as I'm seeing the Psalms, as I'm seeing Psalms 23 and what it reminds us that we live in the midst of God's being, God lives in the midst of our being, that we live in the midst of this feast, what is often required is that willingness to be broken in order to participate in the feast. And gratitude extends beyond us because it's our willingness to be broken for others that we begin to experience the joy and gratitude for ourselves. The smaller our world becomes because we long for things to be fixed for us, the smaller it becomes because we long for things to be right with us or the stuff that we need in order to be content, That's, that gravity pulls us inward. But the more we open up, the more we realize the solar system that's around us of possibilities, the feast that is around us that we'd experience in one another. Look back on your lives and think about what moments you remember over the last week over the last month, over the last year, and those moments will be encounters. Those moments will be the times you had with others or the places you've spent, and not the stuff you have, and not the secure things that we've always said we had to have in order to be happy. When Jesus shared bread, it was always about brokenness. It was always about extension of oneself to another. So this morning, as we break this bread, and as we not, remember not just Jesus' life of brokenness, I want you to also remember this idea of how we are broken for one another. And so I'm going to invite our participants, our, 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 our uh, servers here, that when you take the bread from them, I'm going to invite them not to say anything. They can smile, but what I am going to invite them to do is I'm going to invite them to take a deep breath, and for you to take a deep breath. And for us to be thankful for the moment, for being broken together, for being here for one another, and for the very essence of our lives that we share with one another.